Hello. Today we're going to talk about neuroanatomy, one of my favorite subjects. So, of course, in a neuroscience class, we're going to have to learn about the brain, and we're going to be learning about um, different regions of the brain, some of their structures, and some function. So today, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the, what we call the directional terms, okay? So directions and different sectional um, cuts of the brain so that we can figure out how to sort of navigate our way around the brain. Because in order to describe tissues and describe cellular processes and different um, types of phenomena in a brain section, we have to be able to know how to describe where we're looking and where we need to get to, okay? So we're going to start out with that. So first of all, anatomy has its own sort of language. So neuroanatomy definitely has its own language as well, okay? And then as I said, we're going to be talking about what we call anatomical directions and planes, okay? This is going to help us to get around. It's going to help us to be able to identify and describe different um, structural aspects or features of the brain, okay? Um, and also to be able to compare um, one feature or one structure to another, okay? So we're going to be learning lots of different terms. And one of the things that I wanted to start out with here with directional anatomy is a couple images of mice. So we spoke a bit about animal models and research, and this is something that are, you know, these models are used frequently. So I thought, what better way to start than to show little mice? So here, we're going to identify a few key terms, okay? So if you'll notice, both of these pictures of these mice here, we have the head on this end and we have the tail over here. Okay, now when we're talking about something that is towards the head, okay, direction, we're talking about something that is anterior, anterior, excuse me. So the term anterior or rostral, as you'll sometimes hear it called, means towards the head. Whereas posterior or caudal, okay, is in a direction towards the tail or the coccyx, okay. So this is, um, this coccyx is actually, um, has to do with the spinal column, okay, so that's a portion, the part of the body way down towards the base of the spine, um, or in an animal, it will be a tail, okay, so we have anterior towards the head, posterior towards the tail, we also have these two terms, medial and lateral, okay, so if we were to take a line and we were to bisect this animal directly down the middle, okay, what we would see is that medial means that we are close to the middle line, okay, of this this bisection line, okay, so medial is towards the middle, whereas lateral is towards the edge, okay? So if we start from this point here in the middle, where's my cursor, and we were to move towards the edge, okay, we are moving in a lateral direction. So we are going from medial to lateral, okay? So these words are useful when we're trying to describe whereabouts in a brain section we might be looking, okay? Um, we might be looking at something that's, for example, we might have some damage that's just medial to the lateral ventricle, okay? So if we know what the lateral ventricle is and we can identify that structure and we know which direction medial is, we have some general idea of where we're supposed to be looking, okay? Um, so these are actually some sections from brains that, um, of animals that had injuries, okay? And these are actually some stainings that I performed some time ago. And um, this is actually a Cressel violet stain. So what you can see here are there, um, there's, these are brains, okay, taken from mice. And we have regions here where we have some kind of necrotic tissue. So this is tissue that has died and is injured, okay? So it's dead. In this case, we're missing some. Or injured tissue. Okay, um, but what I really chose this for is not to describe the pathology, because we're going to get to that later, but actually to describe some terms called ipsilateral and contralateral. Okay, so whenever we're talking about something that's ipsilateral, we're talking about something that is on the same side, okay, whereas something that's contralateral is something that's on the opposite side of the body. Um, now, these are relative terms. So, in this particular case, there was a stroke, okay that the animal was subjected to on the right side, okay, of the brain. So the ipsilateral side is going to be the right side because it's ipsilateral to where the stroke occurred since the stroke also occurred on the right side, okay. Contralateral would be the opposite side. So if the stroke, okay, if this is the right hemisphere, 
of the animal and the stroke occurred on the right side of the body, then the left hemisphere would be the contralateral hemisphere, okay? So that's actually the opposite side, okay? And then we have a couple other terms which we call superior and inferior. Now these are kind of easy to remember because if you think of, if somebody says, I'm superior to you, that usually means that they are higher up, right? On a, maybe the totem pole of importance or greatness or amazingness or something of this nature, okay? Um, anyway, superior meaning higher, okay? So something that is superior is above, whereas something that is inferior is below, okay? So here, um, this white matter structure here, we'll get to this later, okay, is actually inferior, okay, to the lateral ventricle because the lateral ventricle is actually this space here, okay? And so this white matter structure is inferior, it's below, okay? And it's actually a bit lateral too, right? So it's a bit lateral and a bit inferior to the lateral ventricle. So these are the types of, types of terms that we're going to be using when we're looking at tissues, okay? Um, now the sectional planes or anatomical planes, and again, we're going to use the rat brain here just because we're going to be looking at some of these, so I thought we'd get used to it. Um, the anatomical planes deal with directions that we're actually going to be slicing through a brain and it could also be a spinal cord if we're dealing with the central nervous system it could be the actual body if we're dealing with the peripheral nervous system so any of if you've seen the bodies exhibit there's lots of sectional planes that were cut through different bodies to show all of the different organ systems and the cardiovascular and, the, and all of those systems really neat if you ever get a chance to see it i highly recommend it. it's actually quite amazing but here we have sectional planes and we're going to talk about a few different ones okay so first we have a sagittal plane now if you look at a sagittal plane okay this basically is a vertical slice okay so we're slicing right through and we're slicing into left and right halves okay cutting it in half so here you can see that we have rostral right and caudal direction so that's towards the head and towards the tail right and we're cutting directly down the middle of this brain so this cut is actually right down this midline here okay so you can't see the midline as well here because half the other half of the hemisphere is behind sort of behind this plate okay but this is where this is going so it's going right down the middle now there's two different ways we can talk about this if our sagittal section or cut is directly through the middle okay so it creates two completely exact halves then we call it mid sagittal all right if it is not exactly in the middle but it's a little bit off center it's so it's cut in the same direction okay it's still dividing into left and right sides except for it's not completely equal okay we call it parasagittal because the cut is just a little bit off center. It's a little bit closer to one side than the other. So maybe a little bit closer to the left side than it is to the right side, all right? The second one is what we call the horizontal section. A lot of times you'll call this the transverse, okay? So this is just the complete opposite cut, okay? So this is going to basically divide you into superior and inferior. Now remember, superior is higher, right? Or up towards the head, whereas it is inferior is down below. Okay, so you have above and below. So we're basically sectioning this right across. So this cut is actually perpendicular, okay, to what a sagittal cut would be. So the sagittal cut would be um, cutting left to right and then the horizontal cuts um, in half the other direction. And then we have what we call the coronal or the frontal plane. All right. So most of the brain sections that we're going to be working with are going to be coronal sections. And these are also vertical cuts, but they actually will divide between front and back. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a section and we're going to slice it right through this brain, but we're going to do it in a way such that we have a view of both hemispheres, right? So we're going to essentially going to see everything that's inside here. And actually, um, I want to go back for a second just to show you. These are coronal sections, okay? So this brain was actually sectioned so that we can cut it. This is the front portion, and the, the back side of this tissue, right, would be further towards the back of the brain. And usually it's going to be cut at a certain thickness, and it just depends on what you're trying to do. Sometimes brain sections are sliced really thin, um, and by really thin, I mean around the order of maybe five microns, okay, which is short for micrometers. 
So you remember units of measure, micrometers are very, very small, micrometers, right? Um, sometimes they can be up to 30 microns or 30 micrometers, so it just depends on what you're doing, right? So enough of the rat, let's go to the human. Same thing, I just wanted to show you an example. So the human brain looks a little bit different than the rat brain, right? One of the major differences that we're going to note with the human brain and the rat brain is that the human brain actually has a cerebellum that is sort of below, right? It's down here, so the human brain sort of comes down around like this, where we have this brain stem region and we have the spinal cord down here and the cerebellum at the base. Whereas the rat brain sort of really, the cerebellum was sort of back here. Okay, so it's just a little bit different shape, same basic structures, they do the same basic things, okay, but just a little bit differently shaped. So anyway, here we have the terms that we learned before, so we'll just review medial, right, because this is towards the middle. So this is actually um, what type of cut that we're looking at here. This is a coronal section. So you can see that this was sliced here and it gives us a front of the brain, okay, and the back divides between the front and the back of the brain, okay? Here, we actually have a horizontal section that was cut this way, okay? So this is going to show us what? Well, it's basically going to show us the top and the bottom, okay? So we have here anterior and we have posterior end, okay? We have the medial portion, and then we move from the middle to the edge. We're going in the lateral direction, okay? So the same sort of thing that we talked about before. Here we have a sagittal section. This is actually mid-sagittal, so that means that it was sliced directly down the middle. So if we could actually see both hemispheres, and there's a, there's a um, very big groove between the hemispheres that we're going to talk about in a minute, it was basically cut right through there. So again, anterior towards the head, posterior towards the back, and we have this sort of middle section. So if you can cut the brain exactly in half, this is what it would look like on the inside. Okay, this is the inside, what we call a medial section. Okay, so um, in here we can sort of see the dorsal surface, right? Is a, again, the back region of the body and the ventral is the under region. So these we sort of talked about before. So, quick quiz. Name those sectional planes. All right, I'm giving the answer now. So that's what you should have gotten. So coronal mid-sagittal, and horizontal. Okay, so let's get on to the actual anatomy of the brain. Now we've talked a little bit about directional terms. We've talked a little bit about sectional anatomy. Now we're going to talk about what the brain is actually made of. And one of the neat things that we can note is that of the mammals, right, throughout all mammalian species, here we've got everything from a rat all the way up through sheep. We've got a dolphin here, a human, okay, very, very similar layout, okay? Similar structure, and we're looking at the big picture. Now, of course, it's not going to be exactly the same, but we have conservation, okay, of three key structures, which is the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem, okay? So these are three major structures of the brain. They do different things. They're all important. And yes, they do work together, but we also have localization of function. So even though all these sections sort of talk to each other, right, and they're all connected, and they form synapses, and they need to communicate with one another. They each do their own stuff. And so we're going to talk about some of that stuff today. If we look at the general surface anatomy of the brain, okay, I'm going to show you a few different views because looking at the brain from different directions, okay, and with different types of sectional cuts, we're going to be able to see different types of brain structures. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at it from a bunch of different directions and we're going to describe some features. You ready? So surface anatomy, we have the dorsal surface of the brain. So here, this is the dorsal surface of the brain. Now what's the dorsal again? The dorsal is the top. So if you were standing over somebody's head and you were to peel their skull back, this is what you would see. Okay, this is the top, the dorsal surface of the brain. Then we also have the ventral surface, which is here. Now this is the underlying region of the brain. Okay, this is the bottom. So if you were able to essentially, you know, get all the way underneath to the very base of the brain, this is what it would look like. And it has a lot of neat features. For example, you can see the brain stem. You can see a lot of the cerebellum region from here. Don't worry, we're going to talk about those in a minute. You can see a lot of cortex from here. You can also see what we call the optic chiasm, okay, and olfactory bulbs. Now, these are important sensory structures in the brain, okay? So some really cool things that we can note from looking at a ventral surface of the brain. 
Now the other two we're going to talk about briefly and then we're going to we're going to discuss in a bit more detail are what we call the lateral surface and a medial view of the brain, okay? So remember lateral in anatomy means it's towards the edge, right? So here, this is the middle of the brain, okay? So medial would be towards the middle and lateral would be towards the edge. So you can see that this is essentially the left hemisphere of the brain, okay? And this is the left edge of the brain. So if you were looking at somebody's brain and you were standing right to the left of them and staring at the side of their head, this is what you would see, okay? If we were to cut that brain in half, this is what you would see. Now this would be the right hemisphere of that same brain, okay, with the left hemisphere lopped off exactly down the middle. So that would be a cut, a mid-sagittal cut right here to cut this brain in half, and this would be the inside of what you see. And again, here we can note some anatomy. We can see a brain stem here coming down to the spinal cord. We can see the cerebellum and some other interesting structures that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. Okay. So in terms of the lateral surface of the brain, some interesting things to note. We have a cerebrum. Right? So the cerebrum, and you've heard maybe the term cerebral cortex, okay? The cerebrum is the largest region of the brain. Typically, when people think of cerebrum, okay, they think of thinking, right? If somebody's very cerebral, you might have heard somebody say that. That Johnny is a very cerebral young fellow. That means that he thinks a lot, and that's a manner of speak really okay but it's derived from the idea that the cerebrum in the brain is really associated with higher level function and higher level thinking so one of the things that people like to emphasize about humans okay compared to other types of animals is our ability to think ahead our ability to plan events to plan how we're going to execute certain things okay the ability to plan seems to be an important one well that's reflective really of a higher level type of processing and if you look over the course of evolution and I'm not going to go back to the slide but you can go back and look at yourself as species have evolved one thing that we have noted is that we have more and more and more and more cerebral cortical tissue cerebral cortex so this is what is thought to be one of the reasons why it, why is species evolve you tend to get some higher level functioning okay so this is this whole read all this cortex here this is all cerebral cortex then we have down here the cerebellum right so the cerebellum is very much associated with the ability to move okay the ability to balance now it's not the only thing that balances in the body right most of you probably know that um your inner ear is extremely important for maintaining balance, but there's also um, very, very strong regulation by the cerebellum for this, okay? Um, sometimes people think of this as kind of like a little mini brain. It's more of a primitive, okay? So the early types of species maybe relied on this much more heavily. And then we have a brain stem. Now the brain stem is composed of a few different regions, and you might see one or two of these different regions included or excluded from brainstem proper depending on who you ask because in neuroanatomy certain people tend to include some structures in brainstem where other people do not it really doesn't matter for us okay so if you happen to come across this don't worry about it but brainstem is important for the big stuff big 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 functions things like making sure that you can breathe okay making sure that your body continues to can well, continues to continuously pump blood throughout it all the time. These are things that you don't have to think about, okay? And this is all sort of regulated by your brain stem, all right? Then another interesting one to note here is the olfactory bulb. Now, this isn't a, really a brain region per se, okay? This is actually a direct outgrowth of the brain, um, so it sort of is. But the olfactory bulb, um, you might see the word olfactory and be able to figure out that this has to do with smell okay so the olfactory bulb is a very important sensory area that actually is a direct outgrowth of the brain and that's kind of what makes this really neat so then when we look at the brain in closer detail so we sort of discussed this before too when we went through the history that we have these different grooves and we have these different um bulges in the brain that we call gyri and sulci, okay, and fissures as well. So we have these different ones, and we're going to identify just a few of them, okay, because we have um, this one particular, okay, sulcus, so this is a groove, right, right here, the central sulcus that sort of comes down around here, 
all right, and sort of divides two important regions of the brain. And we're going to find out in a minute that these um these regions that it divides are actually two different lobes of the brain. Okay, um, so that's why this is an important landmark because it helps us to see the division between two important regions. Um, and these regions actually, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's. Let, I don't want to um, steal my own thunder here, right? Now, on the left side, we have what we call the precentral gyrus, and you might be able to figure out why it's called this because if this is the central sulcus, this is precentral. So it's before the central sulcus, and it's a gyrus because it's actually a bump, okay? So this is the bulge of tissue here that's a bump up, okay? And then the bulge on the other side of the central sulcus, okay, after the central sulcus is the post-central gyrus, all right? So post meaning afterward, so that's the post-central gyrus, okay? So those are those two. Remember, gyri is plural. So we have one gyrus, we have two gyrus, a second gyrus, and together they are gyri. Then we have this lateral fissure. This is also going to separate lobes of the brain, okay? So we're going to go through those lobes in just a minute. So we have the central sulcus and we have the lateral fissure, and these two actually um, are important, important for being able to help us like lav um, navigate around the brain. Here we have what we call the superior temporal gyrus, so we're going to find out in a minute that this there's actually this temporal lobe of the brain. So that's why this is called the superior temporal gyrus. Remember, superior means above. So this is the highest point in the temporal lobe. So it's the superior temporal gyrus. Okay. So again, we sort of started out saying directional terms are important because they help us to navigate around the brain. So if we understand what superior means and what lateral means, etc., we can more easily remember why these terms are called what they're called. So important landmarks. Um, of course, the landmarks help us figure out which regions we're near, and the regions have localized functions. So here's just a good example here. This is these lobes here, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. All right, all have different structures that are involved in different sorts of functions, which we're going to get to, I think, on the next slide. Okay, but again, here, if we were to look at this frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and this temporal lobe, and we were to go back to the previous slide, we can see that the frontal lobe, okay, and the parietal lobe are separated by the central sulcus, whereas the temporal lobe is separated from both of these lobes by the lateral fissure. Okay, so. All right, so in addition to dividing the brain, okay, and noting the landmarks, the important um, gyri and the sulcus and the fissure that we just talked about, and, and identifying the different lobes, we can now start to piece these things together into these different sorts of regions, okay? So in um, the cortical tissue, so again, we're still talking about cerebrum here, okay? So this is all a cerebral cortex. We have motor areas, designated in red here, right? We have sensory regions, which are designated in the green color, and then we have association cortex, okay, which are designated by the purple area, all right? And this isn't something that I really want you to memorize in terms of motor versus sensory versus association and where they are, but it's important to see this because, for example, this central sulcus here that divides these two regions, that actually divides one region that's heavily involved in motor control. So this is primary motor cortex, and there's also association cortex as well, but we're not, we're going to talk about that right now. We'll get to that later. Um, from the sensory area, the somatosensory cortex. All right. So these different regions, if you look to this image at the top, you, there's all these different numbers, okay? Now there's what we call a Brodmann map. Now Brodmann, um, I say Brodmann, was the first person to actually try to map all the different functions that are associated with the different regions of the brain, all right? So if you were to look at a Brodmann's map of the brain, this is what you would find. And essentially what it does is it tells us about all the different functions and where they are seated within the brain. Now, we're not going to memorize all these different areas. It's not really worthwhile, in my opinion, to do so. But we will talk about some of them as we go. Okay? So when it becomes relevant, we're going we're gonna to kind of just pick out some important brain areas as we go through the course, and then we'll discuss them as they come up. 
All right. So we are dividing into these core into these different regions. They are associated with higher level function, which is sort of where we started, right? When we started talking about the cerebrum, your cerebral friend Johnny. Okay. And as I said, we're going to talk about this in detail later. If we were to cut the brain straight down the middle, okay, so this is the medial surface, so what type of section was it? Answer, it was a mid-sagittal cut, okay? So mid-sagittal, cutting the brain directly in half, okay, dividing left and right. So this is the inside, okay, the medial surface of the right hemisphere of the brain. All right, and we're going to point out some important structures here. All right, so we have a few divisions. We're going to divide this basically up into the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Okay, now the forebrain structures, okay, essentially contain your cerebrum and some other structures that are what we call structures of, or our structures rather, of what we call the limbic system. All right, which really is a system that's heavily involved in emotional responses. It's also involved in addiction and some other things, okay? But of these limbic structures, we have a couple right here, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So if you were to look at this place, it's sort of right in the middle of the brain, and it's fitting because the thalamus really is a central hub in the brain for sensory input. Okay, so nearly every sensory um, organ sends projections into the thalamus in some fashion. Okay, so the thalamus is a key structure for collecting sensory information and then projecting and sending signals about this information to other places throughout the cortex. Now, we did identify this cortex as an association cortex, and the reason it's called association cortex is really because it communicates with various different structures of the brain to sort of fine-tune processing, okay, and to allow us to think and coordinate complex behavior, all right? Um, but the seat of the thalamus here is the sensory spot. The hypothalamus, okay, is below the thalamus a bit here, okay? So if we go inferior to it, all right, and a little bit rostral of it, we can actually see that this hypothalamus is here, all right? Now, the hypothalamus is super important. It is involved in regulating a lot of different behavior, including um, thirst and hunger, um, different emotions, and also autonomic nervous system function. So you'll recall that the autonomic nervous system is that which controls all of the things that happen that you don't need to think about. Okay, so the nervous system that operates in the background as you're going around trying to decide what you're going to do with yourself on a Saturday afternoon. So this is this region here. So we have thalamus and then underneath it and a little bit towards the front of the brain, okay, we have the hypothalamus. So these are super important structures. Our midbrain region is essentially, for our purposes and for most people really who study the brain, can you, we can divide into the tectum and the tegmentum. Now this midbrain region is really super important for things like vision, okay, or auditory processing. So processing visual information or audition, auditory information, um, as well as some information that comes from the eyes and other parts of the body goes to this region, all right? So this is essentially what our midbrain does also important, and then we have the hindbrain. Now the hindbrain, we can divide into a few different parts here. We have the pons, all right, and we have the medulla, and we have the cerebellum. Now these are sort of regions that many people sort of consider the primitive, more primitive areas of the brain, because they're involved in such very, very critical body functions, okay? Not really the portions of the body that we would associate with higher level processing or thinking or association. These are sort of control centers for super important things like vital body functions, okay? The medulla, for example, is very important in controlling heart rate, okay, and controlling breathing in the body. Um, we can look at the pons does a whole bunch of different things. It's also interesting thing about it. It's involved in helping you regulate your sleep. Okay. Um, circadian rhythm is regulated by the hindbrain. Okay. Um, and of course the movement and posture of the cerebellum, which is something that we sort of already talked about. So we can think of this as forebrain is a lot of sensory information 
It helps us a lot with motion. It helps us with sensory inputs, emotions, our connections between the sensory environment, how we perceive it, and how we respond to it. Okay, the midbrain is catered more so towards the specific processing of sensory information, so visual information that comes into your body, right, or um, auditory information that exits um, your ear and actually gets projected up. Your hindbrain is really important in vital sort of body functions. And if we keep going through and we look again in this sort of middle part of the brain, this medial part of the brain, we can see some other important structures that I just wanted to point out. So the corpus callosum of the brain is an important fiber tract. And here we can see it's in pink, and you can see the corpus callosum. Now, if we were to be looking from the top of the brain, actually, I think we're going to do that in a minute, it actually traverses both sides. So here we can just see one sort of curve of it. This is a huge fiber tract, okay, so a bundle of axons. Remember, anytime we talk about a fiber tract in the brain, we're talking about the axons of neurons, bundles of axons, many, 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 many axons. And these connect the two cerebral hemispheres of the brain. So this allows some communication between right, lane, right brain and left brain, etc. We also have a fornix. The fornix is another important fiber tract. So again, these are projections. These are axons of neurons that actually relay information from something called the hippocampus to other structures in the brain, some important nuclei, which are collections of cells, and then ultimately to the thalamus, because the thalamus needs to receive this information as well. Again, it's sort of that central hub. But the hippocampus is another limbic structure that is really known by most people to be involved in storing storage of memories. So hippocampus stores memories. And then we have an amygdala seated down here. So if we were to be able to kind of look a little bit, um, excuse me, inferior and once again rostral uh, from where the fornix is located, we come down and this is sort of tucked inside beneath the temporal lobe. Okay, kind of medial to the temporal lobe in here. We can see this amygdala, okay? And this is a very, very important seat of emotion. So if you think about the limbic system in the brain, you have things like your hippocampus, your amygdala, your thalamus, your hypothalamus. So a sensory receiving hub in the thalamus. You have a memory-associated structure, so storage of memory, um, linking events in the hippocampus, and then you have an emotional seat in the amygdala. So it's perhaps no surprise that drug addiction affects the limbic system to a very large degree. And there's actually very specific neurotransmitter systems that send information throughout these limbic structures and in, through actually into the cortex as well um, after taking drugs and in certain environments where individuals take drugs. And not only is the limbic system involved in drug addiction, but it's also involved in basic reward systems in the brain. So why does it feel good when you eat? Right, things like this. And this, these are all really cool, interesting things that we're going to talk about later in the course. Right. So a couple more features to point out in the brain. Um, the ventricles, now we talked about the ventricles, and remember that the ventricles were actually the hollow spaces in the brain that that um, the cerebrospinal fluid, or the CF, CSF, flows throughout. And so it's able to feed the brain with CSF. So here we have what we call a third ventricle. This is in the bottom. Um, and we have a cerebral aqueduct that drains CSF to the fourth ventricle that's located back here. Okay, So this is sort of tucked underneath the cerebellum. Now if we were to look at um, another sort of tilted brain, so now we're tilting the brain a little bit up this way, there's actually this shadow ghost looking part, okay? This is the lateral ventricle of the brain. So these ventricles actually, and I think we have it here. Um, do I have a picture of it? Sorry, I guess I don't have a picture of that one. But if you look at it from another angle, sometimes it's easier to see. But basically we have lateral ventricles that empty into the third ventricle that connect with the cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. So really this whole ventricular system is connected. 
okay? Even though from certain views of the brain, you can only see part of it at one time, right? But all these ventricles connect together, and that's what allows the CSF to be able to continue to flow through, okay? If we were to look at the dorsal surface of the brain, you see we have all this cerebral cortical tissue here, all right? So that's not surprising because the top, really the whole outside of our brain is cortex, all right? If we were to take a couple of clamps shown here and we were to sort of peel back the cortical tissue starting from the central, the central line here and we were to peel it back, this white material underneath here is actually the corpus callosum. So before I showed you sort of a little curved portion because we were looking at a lateral, um, or actually it was a medial section of the brain, and you can only see a little bit of it. If we look from the top here and we were to peel this cortex back, you can actually see that it comes across the entire region, all the way across here like this, okay? And again, here we have this longitudinal fissure that really goes right through the middle. Okay, so this is this is a very important thing. Central sulcus we sort of already talked about. But this longitudinal fissure is the is the division point between the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. All right. If we look at the ventral surface of the brain, I talked a little bit about this before. Okay, we can see some of the forebrain, right? Cortical tissue here. So this is cortex that sort of wraps around the top, and then you can kind of see it on the bottom as well. So it really wraps around essentially this entire portion of the brain here, okay? These are some of these optic regions that I talked about earlier. So this is called the optic chiasm. This is the optic nerve. So the optic nerve actually projects directly from your retina at the back of your eye, and it is a giant bundle of axons. From the, set, from the neurons in your retina that actually project all the way through here to um, the visual centers of the brain. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later too. Okay, um, You can see a lot of these sensory nerves. So if you look here, we have lots of nerves coming in. These are cranial nerves. Okay, So a lot of these feed different regions of the face. And then we have the midbrain and hindbrain regions, right, which you can see very prominently from the ventral surface of the brain, right? So midbrain would be up here, and then we have the hindbrain region down here, okay? Here's the pons, so this gives you an idea. There's the medulla, and you've got your cerebellum here, all right? As we move forward, we're going to be talking more and more about the complex types of interactions that occur between different cell types in the brain. The brain is not a giant neuron. The brain is a extremely complicated network of connections that involves very, very fast signaling, electrical impulses that results in chemical stimulation of neighboring cells. It involves astrocytes that have to nourish the cells, buffer the environment, and make sure that everybody stays healthy. Microglial cells that play a small role in that, but a more major role in actually cleaning up debris, sort of checking around and making sure that um, dead cells or destructive, or um, excuse me, degraded tissue get removed from areas and they respond when there's some sort of a problem. So these are really the immune cells of the brain. Um, and the oligodendrocytes and epidermal cells, which we'll talk about later. All right, so that's it for now. Um, hope you enjoyed. Hope you took very good notes. And I will see you next time.